Today we have something super cool and special for this channel. We have our first ever interview of a cybersecurity professional. Today we're talking with the Belgian bug bounty hunter. His name is XSSRAT. You can find him on Twitter, on YouTube. Uh, he has different courses on Udemy. We'll have links in the description and we're also gonna kind of dive into that a little bit in this interview, but definitely go check him out, he's awesome. But first, before we get into that, like this video if you find it helpful. Hey, if you wanna get into bug bounty hunting, that's a super cool career path. You should probably like this video and then go give XS Rat a follow. And then of course, subscribe for more content because believe it or not, this is not gonna be our last interview. Anyway, here we go. So real quick, just for anybody you know that's watching that uh, you know may not be quite as familiar with your channel, Channel or any of your content, you know, do you mind just kind of giving a quick, you know, overview of kind of what you do, the content you focus on and stuff like that? Yeah, for sure. So my name is DXSS Rad. I focus mostly on YouTube stuff. Um, I do bug bounties tear. Uh, I make guides for everybody so you guys can learn how bug bounties is because for me, bug bounties, is, it's, it's totally different from hacking. It's totally different from pen testing. I want to make that clear. I saw a little bit of a gap in the market where um, I noticed that there was a lot of content regarding bug bounties, but it was more about finding targets and not so much about execution. And that's where I saw a little bit of a gap that I'm trying to fill in now. Um, and I think it's going pretty well because in a year time, I gained almost 9,000 subscribers, which is amazing. Uh, and also, I I'm, I'm made a course um, over, the, over the course of, of that year. Uh, I started creating a course at the beginning, and now it's almost finished. So um, that's also available on my website, thexsrat.podia.com, if you guys are interested. Um, so that's, that's me, basically. I love XSS. <laughs> you guys can probably tell that from my name, um, but I love any vulnerability basically i love logic vulnerabilities i love um i love broken access control eye doors um, as long as it's a vulnerability type i love studying it that's what it comes down to that's awesome and for anybody watching i'll have a link down in the description so you can absolutely go check that out as well uh dude so i see you've been you know in quality assurance and quality control you know professionally so how has that kind of helped with your journey through bug bounties and just kind of looking for these different exploits? I love that question because for me, it all started when I entered my, um, when I graduated high school and I had to pick if I wanted to go to university um, or uh, if I want in, in Belgium, we have this thing a little bit lower than university called a bachelor's degree, uh, which is what I got. Um, and I got it in networking, and that's basically where I learned about hacking because we also had uh, one hour per week dedicated to hacking. Um, but it was very, very basic. So I, I got the basics down. Uh, we talked about security, like like RSA um, encryption keys, really basic stuff. But I loved it, and and that's when I when that spark hit me. Um, and I started with basically a programming career, strangely enough. I studied networking, went straight into programming. Um, and that's where I picked up a lot of these logic skills, a lot of these logic vulnerabilities. In my school career, I picked up a lot of networking skills that are required for bug bounties because I did Cisco, I did Cisco CCNA, I think. Um, and then, of course, as well, I, I went, like you say, into software testing. Uh, and bug bounties is also just a form of testing because quickly sidetrack because bug bounties, in my opinion, is a terrible name. I hate that name. Um, you're not hunting for bugs. You're testing your target for your methodology. You're testing if your target is safe. You're not hunting for bugs because you're never sure if there is one. Um, so with that mindset, you're testing and I'm also testing all day long. I'm learning test case design techniques. Um, I'm learning um, ways to handle methodologies, ways that companies develop their software, which is also very, very interesting because if you learn about the software development methodologies, you learn about things like agile, 
which describe a two week release cycle, which is very interesting for us because that means every two weeks we get new features to test. Well, basically a two week sprint. I say release cycle, but your release doesn't have to be the same as your sprint. You basically develop in sprints of two weeks and then after a while you release. But that also means for us as book bounty hunters that we have to retest our target. And that's knowledge that I gained from learning about these, all of these development cycles. And also it, it taught me a little bit about where most bugs are situated because in, in testing, we have a fallacy called clustering of defects. And it basically describes that if you find a defect, there's likely to be more. Um, that's one thing that I've learned that's helped me quite a lot. If I find an IDOR, I'll test for much, much more IDORs. It, it, that triggers me. Uh, and that's when I go beast mode because I've time and time again, I've done this where I found an IDOR and maybe I found six IDORs in a night. One of them is going to be a duplicate. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, the guy before me, he found one bug and he didn't test anymore if he would have tested more he would have he would have won five more bounties that's idiotic that's all the stuff that i've learned from from my qa job it's really really useful um and then also of course the api calls um because bug bounties you can basically test two ways in bug bounties if you're given a specific target you can test the application itself that you're given, or you can test the API that it's interacting with. Um, and that's what I focus on mostly because if you can hack an API, that also means that if I give you a web application, if I give you a desktop application, um, if I give you a mobile application, it doesn't matter. You just have to learn how to intercept the traffic and how to play around with that. Um, and that's basically what I focus on in my work as well. I did some API automated testing. I did some UI automated testing as well. Those things helped me in creating something really strange. I've created a virtual private server. And if I find a vulnerability and it's easy to automate, I'll actually automate the API calls for that vulnerability and I'll test it every week or so. And then like I said, if, uh, if you're running against a target that does agile, then you have a big chance that they might have regression bugs in there. And that might be a very, very quick vulnerability. So that's a little trick that I like to apply is to do some automation there. Um, and that's all things that I picked up from work, of course, and also mobile testing. Um, I do mobile automated testing. So mobile pen testing is just one step further. You know, it's just one step extra and that's it. Um, all of these things have helped me. And I think whatever job I would have gotten, it would have helped me become a hacker. <laughs> whatever IT job I would have gotten, be it programmer, I would have still known all of these different programming problems. One of the issues that I also found is, of, or at least one of the things that I found is that issues, they often center around integration points because I know how developers work. Um, developers create software um, and if it has to integrate with a different platform, often the platforms are not described properly. It's really hard to program properly for it. And that's where most vulnerabilities are going to arise. Also, if you have software that is built on top of other software or functionality that is built on, on top of other functionality. For example, if you have uh, the, the products right now and you can edit, create a product, you can view a product, um, that's the functionality that's created right now. And a year down the line, they want to export products as well. There isn't going to be any original documentation left of those products. So that's going to be pretty tricky, of course. And that's where bugs arise again. Um, they're going to have to guess how that code works and how it's supposed to work. So um, basically, that's the stuff that I picked up from my QA career. That's about it. Um, 
man, I mean, I feel like there's just so much to bounce off of with what you were talking about. You know, what are uh, some solutions and ways that developers can kind of tie up loose ends on those integration points or to kind of mitigate, you know, uh, I guess, what, what was it the way you called it? Defective clusters? Uh, yeah, clustering of defects. Yeah. yeah. There is, a, for me, the way to mitigate this is, is pretty simple documentation, documentation, documentation. You can't have enough of it. And that's going to be really important later down the line. I am human. I don't know if I can work like, I know that if I develop something now, I don't know how it works a month down the line, let alone six months or a year down the line. So I document everything that I do in a very organized structure as well. Um, and one other thing that you have to really be careful about is shadow APIs, of course. That, that's APIs that you just leave on hanging and, and never disable. Hackers like me love taking advantage of that. If you have a version three of an API, just disable version one as quickly as you can, even though it may be legacy code, try to unravel that spaghetti code and try to actually do something about it. Whenever you see spaghetti code, that's, that's one big recommendation. If you ever see spaghetti code, try to put it on a backlog to refine that stuff, to refactor it. Um, it's going to help you a lot down the line, not just security wise, but maintainability is going to go up so much and it's going to be a lot better. And one thing that's super, very, very important is if you're not sure about documentation, about requirements, ask somebody, don't just assume, because if you assume you're making an ass out of you and me, and that's not a good thing. So it's really important that ambiguous requirements get resolved very, very fast. Um, especially like you have to imagine it like this. If you have a requirement that has a defect in it and it goes further down the line, the next step is going to be development. Development is going to put effort in. Um, then testing is going to put effort in. It might even get into production. And if it's into production already, it's going to have to go through all of those stages again. So it's going to cost you a lot more to fix. Whereas if you just fix it in your original documentation already, then it's fixed and that's, that's good, you know, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, and I know that it's hard and I know that it's impossible to pick out all of those kinks, but it's really important that you try your best <laughs> and actually put the testers, the developers and the analysts together in a room to think about that requirement, that specific requirement. I know that an analyst cannot think of everything, but that's why they have the developers and the testers. And if you, one thing that I've noticed, I'm sorry if I'm talking a little bit about, a little bit too much about the sprint working, but um, if you have too much stories or if you don't have enough time to process all of your stories and actually estimate them properly and your team is big enough, you can divide everything up. You can say, I put one tester, one developer and one analyst into a room and then another team of the same composition and you can go through it in multiple facets. You know, you can go through it a lot faster that way. And you can even let the testers develop their own specialty, let the developers develop their own specialty a little bit. That's good because it makes people feel important. It's, it's something that's really important in, in the company setting to, to have that feeling of belonging and to have that communication as well. And one thing I didn't talk about as to, up till this point is unit testing. That is something that is going to prevent a lot of defects. Um, the unit testing and the integration testing, but it all depends on good documentation because you can have 100% code coverage, but it doesn't mean you have 100% functional coverage. Um, if you just don't program the functionality in, then you don't need to cover it, of course. 
It's as simple as that. And I've seen people with reports. I've seen companies that have very good code coverage. But if you look at what they are actually testing, it's very minimal because it's just not programmed properly. And uh, I see that quite often, actually. Um, besides that, you also have different levels of code coverage, which can help you prevent this stuff as well. You can go very, very deep and you can go into atomic, uh, atomic code coverage. You can go into statement coverage. You can go into conditional coverage. There, there's many different layers. So investigate which one is right for your team and your company and implement it properly. And then also attune with the developers and the testers who is going to test what at what level. It's all of this stuff sounds like a lot, but it's all preparation and it's going to save you a lot of trouble down the line. The testing triangle is very important to me. If a manual tester knows which unit tests are being made, he's not going to have to retest all of those different extremities again. And he's going to be able to focus, or she, of course, is going to be able to focus on just testing their scenarios properly. That's something that's going to prevent a lot of problems, in my opinion. But that's something not every company is the same, of course. So, um, man, there's there's some wisdom in that. <laughs> and I've I've mentioned in a couple of my videos, like you know, it's it's better to just you know put the work in early than have to deal with the the potential result on the back end. And of of course, in this case, the potential result is a, is a breach. You know, and, and we've we've. Already this year, I mean, 2021 is crazy, but we already, we had solar winds that kind of came out last year, but rolled into this year. We've got now exchange, which is huge. And, you know, it all, it all comes down to just, you know, taking care of business on that front end. Um, quick question on, you know, just how you got into bug bounty hunting, if there was any particular program or a person that, you know, kind of got you into it. Well, for me, it was basically my friends because I did, my story is that I did a lot of testing. I wanted to get into hacking really bad and I actually bought Certified Ethical Hacker Handbook from uh, a, a Humble Bundle that was available. Um, I bought it. I asked the pen test tracker company if I should take that exam because I wanted to become a pen tester as well. And he told me, no, you should really go for OSCP. OSCP has a proven value. You have a 24-hour exam. There is no getting out of that. You know, you have to really know your stuff. Uh, so I took that. That's where I basically started my hacking career a little bit. Um, but I met some friends along the way in a Slack group and uh, those friends, they kept encouraging me to actually try bug bounties. Um, they were like, no, no, come on, you have to, you have to see every target as if you are the first person to test on it. Everybody has their own unique style of testing. So you just have to realize that you are a unique person who's going to have unique vulnerabilities that they find. Um, so that, that kind of pushed me in. Uh, and it's also, of course, stuck the guy that he has amazing positive vibes around hacking. So he pulled me in kind of a little bit. He was sort of like my inspiration to become a YouTuber as well. Um, and then I, it all started. I became, I wanted to become a pen tester. I needed that experience. I really did because in Belgium, they don't hire pen testers that don't have experience. It's simple as that. So I was like, okay, I'll do bug bounties then. I, I was really hesitant at first, but my friends convinced me. Uh, and I started at Hacker One, which went pretty decently in the sense that I made a lot of mistakes, but mistakes are experienced in my eyes, so I didn't make them in vain. Uh, I learned a lot from them, and that's what matters. I reported stupid things like, like should, uh, ID should never be sequential, um, all of those best practices, 
Um, but then eventually I found a, a cross-site scripting at one of those integration points that I was talking about. I entered a cross-site scripting attack vector in the web uh, client and I opened the desktop client. It was an HTML5 client and it actually displayed my attack vector. So um, that was my first cross-site scripting that I found. And from there on, I wanted to report some more stuff, but I couldn't anymore because I had negative karma on Hacker One, um, And my report, my course of scripting was a duplicate. So I, that didn't bring my karma up any good. Um, and at that point, I had a choice. I could either go to bug route, I could go to integrity, or I could look for a security.txt file. Um, and my first choice was to go to integrity, which was a really good choice in my opinion. I immediately felt at home there. Um, I learned from my mistakes at Hacker One, and integrity they don't give you negative points if you report something that's invalid, not applicable, informative. Um, so I still made a few mistakes, of course, but that's where I first found my real cross-site scripting that was valid. Um, it was just a cross-site scripting hidden very deep in the functionality of a website in some table header that was really, and that's, I'll, I'll get to that later. It was really hidden deep. And I always say dig deep. Um, I mean it, dig really, really deep, go to the extremes and then you'll find stuff that you thought you'd never find before. Um, when that cross-site scripting popped, my heart popped a little bit as well. <laughs> um, I reported it immediately because I could steal cookies and I could uh, drag them out of the website using a video tag, uh, which was an HTML5 trick to get around the CSP. Um, and it, from there on, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do now? Am I gonna keep looking for cross-site scripting? I really like this type of vulnerability. But if I think about it in the wild, it's not as prevalent anymore. I've noticed it. Um, can I look for other types of vulnerabilities? Um, I started looking around a little bit then, and I found that none of the vulnerabilities would be easy to find. Um, because I was, and I realized that now, I was going in with a completely different mindset. I, I, was, I was wrong, I was completely wrong. And I think a lot of bug bounty hunters do the same thing. If you're watching, I'm trying to convince you now, don't approach any target with a methodology. A methodology is really good for a pen tester, um, but not for a bug bounty hunter. What we need to do is we need to look at each target in its own right and develop a strategy based on that target. Like if you have a newspaper in front of you, you need to think, okay, I'm gonna attack the paywall specifically, and I'm going to attack the login scenario, the forgotten password scenario, maybe some IDORs on the account section, um, buying subscriptions maybe, then in the invoices of those subscriptions, I might test for IDORs as well, canceling my subscription, um, then look in those documents for IDORs possibly. There is a heap of possibilities, but you have to think of a strategy before you attack your target. Um, and then you don't attack that old. You first walk it manually and you use it like any normal user would because you want to gain experience into what your application is doing. If you find a vulnerability, you need to be able to recognize it. That's very important. I've been able to report vulnerabilities that have slipped right under a lot of people's notice because all of the programs that I hack on are old, very old. Um, they are not new. Um, and I still get vulnerabilities on there that are not duplicates. So I think these, dupl these vulnerabilities are really funny things like um, a manual telling me that I cannot do something. I try to do it and it's possible. And bam, there goes a bounty. That's <laughs> like why they're telling stuff. you not to do it. <laughs> it's because they know it'll work and they want you to do it. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. So, I mean, I want to kind of go back on something you said about, you know, 
making mistakes and how important that was. And I have a question about, you know, just mistakes that you've noticed, you know, novice bug bounty hunters make, but I want to lead that off really with um, how important it is to make mistakes, especially whenever you're starting off with something. Cause I mean, I know, especially for me with, you know, not only like my career, but even with my, my YouTube channel, there's kind of a fear with making mistakes, but I've always walked away from that just thinking like, wow, well, if I didn't make that mistake, I wouldn't have learned this lesson. So, you know, kind of what are your thoughts there? Yeah, exactly. The people who are successful are the people who have made a million mistakes. Um, for every good decision that I've made, I've made 50 bad ones. And I've made bad decisions. I've made horrible decisions and I've learned from them. Like, um, recently there's been some controversy because I also had an Android bug bounty course uh, in one of those files uh, in one of those PowerPoints that I created myself I use a screenshot from uh, a medium article that was wrong I should have contacted the person I know that but um, in my opinion should I contact everybody or not? I don't know, like, should I contact all of my sources or should I just cite them? For me, citing is enough, maybe for some people not. Um, but anyway, okay, I was wrong, I admit that. Um, and I made my mistake and I made it right again. Um, I emailed the person from the Medium article because I sold five courses and I was willing to compensate him for those five courses. And then I made my Android course for free available. So if you guys want, the Android course is available for free on my website. Um, so you make mistakes, you learn from them, and sometimes you fall hard. But the higher you go, the harder you can fall, of course. That's also something you have to deal with, something you have to take into account. A lot of people, they don't consider that success also comes with a lot of responsibility um, because here in Belgium, we say that high trees catch a lot of wind. And I think it's very, very true. Um, that's something you have to be very aware of. Also, if you want to be a bit of a public figure, that it comes with a lot of responsibilities and all of the mistakes you make are going to be public. So that's when it gets even harder to admit that you are wrong that's something very very important admitting that you are wrong and opening up your mind and it's hard i'm not gonna deny that you probably know this as well for me it's really really hard to open up my mind to ideas that are not mine because it it sort of goes like against my human nature for some reason um but you have to because other insights into a world are going to bring you so much good, you know. Um, and that's also what I like about the public failings. People will point it out to you and you will be able to learn from it. Whereas you are, if you are on your own and if you're just trying things, if you're stumbling along, it's harder to notice those mistakes as well. Um, that's something that we have to be careful about, I think. Yeah. And I do want to say like on, on the note about your course and to your credit there, like, I mean, you acted really quickly. I was following along on Twitter. Like I, I just kind of started seeing it on my timeline and it's like, I mean, just as soon as someone pointed it out, I mean, you were on top of it acting pretty decisively. And, you know, I think that's a good example to set for other people, you know, that are wanting to get out there when faced with, you know, hey, here's here's an issue that we need to, you know, grapple with, you know, don't don't delay, you just just jump on it, you know, accept responsibility and, you know, attack it and make it right. And, you know, I, I think you're, you know, you did really good there. Yeah, that's very important. Accept responsibility for your mistakes. I've seen countless people they argue when their mistakes are being pointed out or they they go into a very defensive mode and it seems natural to be a human to do that but try to put that aside and actually accept the fact that you've made a mistake and, and actually admit it as well it's, it's very important not just to yourself but to everybody okay I've made a mistake um, 
But it's also important, in my opinion, that if you don't feel like you have made a mistake, that you should stick to your guns. Um, nobody is able to tell you what's right or what's wrong. Um, there is no human that can decide about that. There is no deity that can decide about that for me. Um, you do what's morally right for you. And for me, this was what's morally right. I felt bad for that person because I had used his content. So I did feel bad for him. And that's why I sent the mail. And that's why I opened up the course as well. Um, and that's what you should always be following, your moral compass. It's very important to follow your instincts in bug bounties, in security, in pen testing, in anything, you know. Um, and just accept responsibility as well. Have, have you ever, you know, encountered when presenting your fi findings after a bug bounty, um, you know, and you, and you encounter resistance to your findings that maybe, you know, whoever you're presenting to is not necessarily, or is saying that it's not necessarily their problem, you know, or, or that you might be wrong whenever very clearly, you know, as you have the evidence to back it up, you are correct. That, that something can be broken in a certain way. Yeah. Are you talking about like bug bounties and triage? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I've had, I have had that happen before. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult because it's sort of, up to the point of a triager as well, in my opinion. And some triagers will allow some stuff that I think like, how the heck did this ever get to triage? Um, and it's also very confusing because a lot of my students come to me and they say, yeah, but look at this, there is a activity report of it. Yeah, but it's so, first of all, company dependent, second of all, triager dependent. I've had a JWT token that I was able to forge on a website. Um, and of course I reported it, it got denied because they weren't able to find any impact from it, um, which was messed up because I had a video recording. Um, the three archer did things wrong constantly. He recorded his actions. It was very clear that he was doing things wrong. Um, and it was very frustrating for me, but you have to keep calm and just explain your point of view um, and, and just go on with the issue. If you are calm and if you are respectable for everybody, you know, you have to put yourself in the triagers position as well. They get maybe 2000 bucks to review every single day. And if it's not immediately apparent and maybe they are not as technical as you as well. Maybe they are just somebody who has been hired because a triager doesn't have to be as technical as somebody like us. Like if we find a super complex vulnerability, it might be hard to explain as well. Um, so I just kept explaining. I kept calm and respectfully and towards him. I had to open a new vulnerability. It was fixed by the time I had to open that new bug. There was no more testing. I could no longer report it. Um, I was pretty angry. I asked for remediation from HackerOne, but nothing ever came of it. So I just left it for what it is. I'm not going to waste my time that I could be hunting on something that's clearly not gonna happen. I know it was because it was an account takeover, it was quite a high price, of course, it was $4,000 or something. Um, but I'm not gonna lay awake over money. Money is the least of my worries. Um, if I am hunting, I am actually trying to learn. That is what I'm trying to do. And if I do find a vulnerability on top of that, that is good, but it is not my first priority at all. That's you why sound I like a, a wolf, like as long as I'm hunting, it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, you know, in, in your first video to kind of tie this into your YouTube channel, you posted in March 12 of 2020, which it's what days of today, March 6th. So we're six days. Yes, yeah, six days. 
quick maths, right? We're six days away from your one year anniversary. So congratulations on that, man. But you, you talked you, about friend. picking a, a bug bounty program. Uh, and so for, you know, people that are, are watching this and are interested in becoming a bug bounty hunter and are kind of looking for kind of their first program to dive into, you know, what are some traits that they can look for? Yeah, that's a very good question and very important as well, because picking your target is 90% of the work. It's going to be very, very hard. Um, it depends on what type of a hunter you are, of course. If you're the very technical type of hunter, uh, then you can go for very wide scope targets, go for um, things like Red Bull on Integrity, uh, that's star.redbull.com or .star, I believe, that they have which is like a very big scope and then you can then you can let your automation skills run wild um, but you can also go very functionally um, what i prefer to give if you don't mind is things to avoid in programs as a beginner um, i think that might be a li little bit more interesting um, yeah for sure for me, as a beginner, you often see, and this is a big trap, you often see recon videos on YouTube. Uh, when you search for bug bounties, you're going to look at recon videos, and that is okay. But as a beginner, I would try to focus more on main apps, things like um, the newspaper I talked about maybe, um, but the newspaper is a bad one because newspapers have very limited functionality. So that's one to avoid. Avoid things with very limited functionality. You should also avoid web shops, in my opinion, because for a web shop, you're going to need to do investments. You're going to need to buy things because you also want to test that process. You're going to need to return the item. You're going to need to add some complexity to your testing. And in the beginning, you want to keep it as simple as possible. So always go for requests that have very clear to read um, requests. If your target has very obfuscated requests, for example, sometimes the request can be encrypted as well. Um, and I would definitely not recommend those as a beginner. If your target has any difficulty in deciphering the requests, I would avoid it. Um, if your target has, um, if your target doesn't give you any account, like static website, um, like for example, the website of your city hall might just be a static website. It doesn't give you any accounts, no details, avoid it. It's not going to be worth your time. There's no functionality to test there. Um, I prefer it if, in a, if the website lets me create my own accounts and I, actually prefer it even more if they let me create accounts of different um, different privilege levels. So those are some good things that you can look for. And one last thing that you should really, really always avoid is if your target is talking about this huge out of scope list um, with very basic things out of scope, like, yeah, we know cross-site scripting is out of scope. We know CSRF is out of scope. We know this is out of scope. Yeah, avoid that. It's wrong like the like it's the plague, you know. <laughs> That's going to be hard to get. And one thing you should always avoid is very big payouts. If it says fifteen thousand dollars as a payout, you might want to wait till later. Uh, it's probably very secure. Yeah, I got you. Those are hey, those are awesome. Those are awesome points. I have a, a few more questions on that, but we're, we're coming close to time, so uh, I want to be sure to ask a couple, uh, not necessarily cybersecurity questions, if that's all right. Um, yeah. One would be about, you know, what got you into creating a YouTube channel? That's a really interesting question. Um, I told you about these friends that I had a group with when we did OSCP. Um, they asked me a lot of questions because I was one of the first to get OSCP in there. Some other people had it as well. Um, and I love explaining stuff, so I explain it to them every time. But I noticed some questions kept coming back. Um, and that's when I decided to make a little bit of videos. Um, it started out with, with bug bounties because I did some bug bounties. I got some bugs by then. 
and they started asking me, hey, uh, well, how do you pick a platform or like what's cross-site scripting? How do I test for it actually? Um, so that's when I started making those videos and other people started watching and it kind of exploded from there. Um, uh, when I got into the top 20 at, Int at Integrity, I used it to make some advertisement for myself on Reddit as well. Like, hey guys, I'm a top 20 hacker on Integrity, come watch my videos. Um, so that all helped, of course, and, and collaboration with other content creators like you, that's, that's one of the best things to do to get a bigger audience, you know? Um, so awesome. thanks for the question. It's, I, have, I have a buddy who we were talking about whenever I was like just starting, I think it was my current job. He was like, yeah, if you, if you find yourself doing something more than twice, automate it. <laughs> and it's like, YouTube is like, you're automating describing things, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, you, you know, you, you, if someone asks a question, you just send them a link to the video and be like, Hey, here's your answer. Don't worry. <laughs> I've done that so often since I've become the XSS rat. I've been sending video after video after video. <laughs> hey, That's, funny. This help them? That's funny. Uh, so, and then another, you know, quick question. So uh, as you know, COVID kind of starts to come to, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this year, please, I just, man, but you know, and, and people start traveling again, you know, what are some cool things people can do out in Belgium that maybe you wouldn't necessarily find on like Google or like some of the major like travel boards? That's a really cool question as well. For me, uh, I love theme parks. I really love theme parks. Um, of course, those are going to be on the major platforms. You're going to find them. Um, but the zoos are going to be a little bit less described and we have one close to here called Powaki Zoo. Um, it's a pretty small zoo, you'd say, but it has a gigantic area to walk in and, and giant like bird cages and you can walk around with the monkeys and all that stuff. So really cool stuff there. Um, and also, he, not here in Belgium, but like five minutes away from me in, in the Netherlands, I live really close to the border, there is a game hall, we also have those in Belgium, by the way, uh, where you can play like these old arcade games that they used to play. Um, that stuff hasn't been in Belgium for a while, but it's coming back, so I'm really glad for that. And there's also center parks, of course, which is like a park where you can... Uh, rent a cottage and it's connected to a subtropical swimming paradise basically so really Whoa. interesting to do i uh you know my my brother and my wife and i we all studied abroad but like in different places i went to china my brother went to paris and my wife went to spain and then greece but uh so i've i haven't been to europe but i'd love to go so I, and you know, my brother has only a he, well, he, I don't think he, he made it to Amsterdam, but he loved it. I mean, close-ish, you know, and I, I'd love to go out and just kind of travel around too. So that's cool. I've taught um, performance testing in Amsterdam to, um, I think it was the Dutch government even. <laughs> I taught wow. a five day course there, an expert course in performance testing. How was that? Was that must have been pretty cool? Oh yeah, I loved it. My work paid for it. All expenses paid. The hotel paid. I could eat wherever I want. Even my wife could come along because she had a holiday back then, and they had to pay the room for two people anyway. So my wife could just come along. You know, <laughs> really cool trip. And That's... the Dutch people, really cool people. They wanted to come in at 10 a.m. and they wanted to quit at 3 p.m. <laughs> can we please in america do that that'd be so cool <laughs> and like I, I i'm the one to complain right i work from home <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like peak laziness on my part but i don't know that's so cool that's awesome yeah i love doing that i love teaching that's why i also started courses of course Cool. Well, dude, this has been an absolute blast, man. I got, I mean, just a billion more questions, but maybe, you know, another time we can, you know, continue to go through this, man. Dude, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate your time and it was a pleasure meeting you. Hey, be sure to thank XSS Rat by following him on YouTube and on Twitter. He's an awesome dude. I really appreciate his time on this channel imparting his wisdom and he's an excellent bug bounty hunter. Just to know, if you wanna be the best, you gotta learn from the best. And hey, this is one of the best, so definitely do check out his content, especially if you're wanting to get into bug bounties you'll be in good shape. So with that, like, comment, subscribe. See ya.